I'm curious about what excites you. She said, spreading out that. Well, this is incredible. To be honest, this is a really awkward situation. It's really embarrassing and somewhat pitiful for me to convey my feelings to her. But she is very serious, and facing her, I have no choice but to be honest with my feelings and body. My name is Zach Sullivan. I'm a fledgling comic book assistant who just moved to New York. I dreamed of becoming a comic book artist in the future, but I gave up because I lacked the knack for it. However, I was well suited for the assistant tasks crucial to constructing a comic, like backgrounds and inking, so I decided to pursue it. What does a comic book assistant do? I often get asked. The truth is, a comic book artist doesn't draw everything in their work. In any comic, there are characters, there's a background, dialogue, and various lines added to enhance the illustration. It's impossible for a single comic book artist to do all of these tasks. That's where we, the assistants, come in. While we can't draw eyes or expressions like the artists, we can handle backgrounds, clothing decorations, and the task of pasting patterned paper, called tones, even erasing pencil marks. So, us assistants help with the paths that anyone to some degree can draw. By the way, when we say inking, we mean filling it in with black. It's a technique used everywhere from hair to decorations, and it's one of our jobs as assistants. But even if we draw backgrounds and do various things, our names never appear. Still, I also have the desire to support hit works from behind. With that aspiration, I became an assistant. In fact, I'm feeling a bit anxious as my assignment is going to change in a week. The artist I'm currently assisting broke his arm and can't draw comics. If there are no comics, we assistants have no job. When I was worried about what to do, the artist I was assisting suggested I become the assistant to an artist named Gabriella. Gabriella, recently debuted, is an artist with a serial in a men's magazine. Gabriella's comic seems like an adult romantic comedy with a little bit of a risque scene, but it's actually a very interesting piece full of humor and jokes. It's getting a lot of attention and has been nominated for several awards. So, why did I get the offer to become such an amazing artist's assistant? Apparently, my style of drawing is similar to Gabriella's, and she was looking for a male assistant. I was relieved that I wouldn't have to worry about my living, but meeting the comic artist always makes me nervous. So, today, I came to the department store to buy some nice clothes at least for the first time, but my wallet, it's gone. Unbelievably, I had dropped my wallet, a major disaster. It didn't have much money, but losing cards and my driver's license is a big problem. I retraced my steps to see if I had dropped my wallet anywhere, and that's when it happened. I found a woman holding my wallet near the cash register on the floor that sold men's and women's underwear. Oh, that's my wallet. How, oh good. Is it yours? The petite and plainly dressed woman handed me my wallet. I was relieved that she had found it, and I received my wallet from the woman. She was wearing a worn-out, baggy sweatshirt, looking as if she had just stepped out in her house clothes. Yet, her shopping basket was filled with quite bold, rather daring underwear in reds and purples. Just to clear up any misunderstanding, I didn't intend to look. The basket only had underwear, and they were brightly colored, so they just caught my eye. She was wearing ragged clothes, but the underwear was her game changer. The stark contrast between her appearance and the items she was purchasing left me momentarily stunned, but all I could do was thank her for picking up my wallet. It seems she was about to turn it into the cashier's. Thank you, you saved me. No problem. I'm glad it found its way back to you. Now, if you'll excuse me. She bowed slightly and left. Maybe she's normally plain but wants to impress her boyfriend. I couldn't help but fantasize, and she left a strong impression on me. That's why I was so surprised to run into her again. I never imagined that the one who picked up my wallet was Gabriella. A week after meeting her, I had an awkward moment when I saw her in Gabriella's studio, where I was about to start as an assistant. She didn't seem to remember me very well, but she did remember picking up my wallet. It's strange how things work out. She laughed, still in her ragged sweatpants, engrossed in her work. According to the veteran assistant, 
She used to draw with ink and wore such ragged clothes so she wouldn't have to worry about getting them dirty. She's working digitally more and more these days, but she feels she can't really get into the zone unless she's in sweatpants. That's her basic style when she works. But apparently, she sometimes forgets to change before going out, and the neighbors look at her strangely. I can't deny it. My first impression was that she was weird too. Oh, Zach, can you fill in this area for me? Sure. She may be quirky, but all the work she creates are very interesting. It's not as well known as the weekly magazines because it's a men's magazine, but her name is gradually getting out there because she's been nominated for awards. It's not an exaggeration to say that this is a critical time, so it's a mystery. Why did she hire a new male assistant? From what I can see, they are not in dire need of assistance. I've been an assistant here for about a month and I've noticed that the other assistants have been with Gabriella for a long time and can manage just fine without me. So I had my doubts. The reason became clear the next day. Zach, can I have a moment? Eh, oh, yes. I was suddenly called by Gabriella. She's a quiet person and rarely speaks unless it's work related. She's capable of having a conversation, so it's not a problem, but... I was surprised because she had never spoken to me in the studio except to give instructions for the Mongo. I went to the room in the back. This is the reference room. There's a big table and various materials necessary for drawing Mongo are stored here, and that's where I usually search for materials, but for some reason, today the table was covered with flashy women's underwear. Dak, which one do you think is good? Eh, I wanted to ask which underwear would excite you. Gabriella told me something outrageous in a matter-of-fact tone. Because she said it so normally, I was the one who ended up feeling embarrassed. From the colors of the underwear on the table, it looked like some of the ones she was buying when I first met her. I thought she was buying them for herself, but it seems she bought them as references for her comics. Uh um, why are you asking me? All the other assistants in my studio are women, so I can't get a straightforward male opinion. I've been using the usual sexy scenes, but I'm running out of ideas. You're around the same age as my target audience, so your opinion would be helpful. I see. So that's why she was looking for a male assistant. Apparently, there used to be a male assistant, but for various reasons, he quit, and I was the one who came in. I understood the circumstances, and I accepted the reason why I was hired, but this was very awkward. Of course, this is just for drawing manga. It's not an indecent question, but, for me, it's like revealing my preference in underwear to her. But Gabriella had a very serious look on her face, so as her assistant, I had to answer. Um, well, for heroin, I think black would be nice. Oh, black, but doesn't black look plain? The heroine of this work is cool, isn't she? Black has a bit of sexiness and is perfect for the image of a cool girl. But if the design is like this red one with a little lace, it also has a cuteness, and it leaves an impact when you see it briefly. I said that, pointing at the red underwear. It was a cute design with lace and frills, the kind of design I like. Watching me, Gabriella said, black. I thought men preferred brighter colors, but black does suit the heroine. Yeah, thank you. Thanks to you, I think I can raw a good scene. Gabriella seemed ecstatic as she said this, and quickly returned to her desk in the studio to start drawing with incredible fervor. She is the type of person who can't rest until she's drawn her ideas out, and I felt a sense of joy contributing to her work in some small way. As I quietly tidied up the materials she had laid out. Several months later, we found ourselves in a crisis. In the depths of winter, Gabriella had fallen ill and we were facing the possibility that we might not be able to complete the manuscript in time. The manuscript had to be submitted by tomorrow, and we were in the final stages. But an unwell Gabriella was unsteady on her feet and certainly not in a state to draw as she usually would. Moreover, only at such a time, we cannot skip it because we have a project for the opening color pages. Ek, just a bit more. Gabriella was doing her best to work while sticking cooling patches to her forehead. Only a few more pages. If she could just draw those, we assistants could handle the rest. But she was unable to draw because her hand was trembling. 
Gabriella stood up shakily with a feverish look on her face and, for some reason, walked over to me and grabbed my shoulder. I hate to ask you this, but Zach, can you do the drawing? What? Both I and the other assistants were taken aback. It's our job as assistants to draw the backgrounds and the inking. Sure, we'll draw as much as you want if you ask us. But there are things that only the comic artist, the master, can draw. I can't possibly take on that role. I've done what's necessary. But there's one more page. Don't worry, Zach. You can do it. After all, it was your idea. With those words, Gabriella showed me the page she hadn't been able to draw. What? It was a scene where the heroine's skirt gets flipped up, revealing her underwear. What you might call a fan service scene. The heroine's expression, body, clothes, everything was drawn. But the crucial underwear was completely black. It was just a plain, white underwear. When we talked about underwear, I thought, Zach would draw. The perfect underwear, for the heroine. But, but, just sketch it out. That's all you need to do. I can't think about the design right now. The truth is, a scene like this should have been drawn by Gabriella herself. I'm sure Gabriella wanted to draw it too. That's why she bought the underwear and even came to ask me for advice. But if she were to draw it in her current shaky state, the result would probably not be good. So, that's why she asked me to do it. It was a decision she made prioritizing the quality of the work over her own desire to draw. All right, but I'm just doing the design, okay? Moved by her passion, I agreed to her request and grabbed a pencil. Comic artists and their assistants naturally draw all sorts of things. Crowds of people, dense forests, animals, and sometimes even the human body in its natural form. So I didn't mind drawing underwear. But, feeling the pressure of having been chosen by her, I went a bit overboard. Because, when the manuscript that was barely finished in time was finally published in a men's magazine, while the story was certainly praised, the scene I worked on was pointed out as being clearly over-detailed lol and it became a topic of discussion, giving it an unexpected fame. I guess that can be helped. After all, I wanted to make a peek-a-boo scene where the heroine looks as cute as possible and leaves a strong impression and I worked hard on the design with that in mind. Even she was pleasantly surprised, saying, you drew underwear that suits the heroine better than I expected, and now I've ended up being in charge of drawing the underwear in our work. I wondered if it was really okay for me to be doing this, but all the characters that appear in the work are my children. Don't you want to dress your children in nice clothes? And your underwear designs have been well received by the fans. Gabriella was so convinced of this. I'm glad that she's left the underwear design to me, and I'm getting better at drawing it, but I feel a bit awkward about it, especially since the other assistants steeze me about it. Lately, I've even been given some pretty bold underwear as possible reference material. Just to be clear, I don't feel bad about this at all, so for me, there's no issue whatsoever. Thanks to this, I, who was once an outsider as a newcomer, could fit in. It was at that moment. Zach, can I talk to you for a minute? As it happened before, it was Gabriella who called me. I wondered if it's going to be another underwear talk. Would you like to grab dinner sometime? Yeah. Well, you know, when I fainted you helped me a lot and I haven't thanked you yet. Gabriella, as usual, said something outrageous with a straight face. By the way, when she said she fainted, she was referring to after the underwear incident. She fainted right after she finished her manuscript. All of the assistants besides me were women who couldn't carry her, so I ended up taking her to the hospital. Sure enough, she had a cold and was told to rest for a while. But Gabriella basically lived in her workspace, which only had a cot and a small kitchenette. I couldn't just leave her alone, so I ended up carrying her for a while. I'm sorry, Zach, for always causing trouble. That's okay. I'm not busy anyway. I remember having such a conversation, but it was quite difficult from there. Gabriella has quite a selfish side. I don't want to take medicine. I'll get better if I sleep. You're being given medicine because you won't stay in bed. Sometimes she would suddenly refuse to take her medicine and throw a tantrum. Other times, she would say, eating is such a hassle, 
and wouldn't even try to eat, so I reluctantly had to feed her. There was a terrible time when her fever slightly dropped. She declared, I'm feeling better so I'll draw comics, and literally glued herself to the drying table. No way, you still have a slight fever, right? There's plenty of time until the deadline. Please recover now. I don't wanna. If I don't draw now, I'll forget. You got sick because of your actions, so please accept it. I can't even count how many times we had this exchange. Recalling it now, I almost want to cry because of the hardships. So, what's it gonna be? Are you in or not? It seemed like there was a pause as I was reminiscing about the past after being invited by Gabriella for dinner. Gabriella was tilting her head in curiosity. Of course, I was pleased with the invitation. But I glanced at Gabriella's clothing. Sure, let's go. But no sweatpants. Huh, can't I? No, please buy new clothes once in a while. I had a hard time looking at the worn out sweatpants she was almost at her limit with. But Gabriella was oblivious and even dropped a bombshell by saying, Okay, then Zach, you go buy some clothes. I'll tell you my size, and you can bill me for it later. Why me? Well, because. We're going to dinner together, and I don't know what kind of clothes you would like me to wear. Gabriella tilted her head in confusion as I let out a heavy sigh. She doesn't understand men at all. Listen, Gabriella, that's something you ask a man you're interested in. Yay, that's why I'm asking you. Huh. I froze at Gabriella's serious expression. What did she just say? In context, it sounds like she's interested in me. Gabriella, I like you, Zach. I was wondering if I could wear the underwear that you like. Ah, uh, stop, stop. I hurriedly cut off Gabriella, fearing another bombshell was about to drop. This person, she really is hopelessly clueless in every way. Okay, I get it. Just get yourself together for now, and please wear this. We can eat wherever you'd like. Do you mean anywhere I'd like? Then it might be a burger shop. That's fine. Let's go there. Gabriella. Other than comics, she doesn't seem to care much about anything else. And she can be pretty clueless about the world, too. As a comic artist, I admire her. But when I look at her as a person, she's so worrisome that it's to the point where I feel compelled to keep an eye on her. I think it's about time for her to develop some human-like qualities. I remember thinking this as I stayed by her side, oblivious to the fact that in six months, I'd be dating this very artist. A woman named Gabriella Miller. Moreover, I had no idea that I'd be launching my own career as a comic artist. But at that moment, all I was thinking was how I needed to turn Gabriella into a decent human being while I was busy drying sexy underwear. It had been four years since I last saw my ex-wife. Unchanged and beautiful as ever, she appeared in the cafe. Upon taking her seat, she fixed her gaze on me and revealed why she'd asked to see me today. I was at a loss for words. After all, I hadn't even expected that this could happen. Please, we might still have a chance. Won't you give it another try? Her words, suggesting we still might have time, resonated deep within me. Could we really make it in time? I had no idea if trying again would work. However, I'd always regretted leaving my ex-wife, not being able to empathize with her feelings. I knew I'd certainly regret it if I pushed her away now. All right, let's give it a shot. And so, the time started ticking again for the two of us. My name is Jeff Johnson. I'm 28 years old. I've been working at a securities firm since graduating from college. This job where big money moves, initially the pressure was so great that I thought about quitting many times. But I kept questioning myself, wondering if I was only capable of this much, and somehow managed to keep going. Now, at the age of 28, I've become what they call an ace in the firm. Once I've made it this far, my ambition for my job kept growing. I wanted to improve my performance further and get promoted. I wanted to prove to everyone that I'm capable of more than they see. Even when I'm not at work, I've found myself thinking about it. The time I've spent with my wife, 
whom I married at 26, named Hannah, was gradually decreasing. Hannah, a stay-at-home wife, handled all household chores perfectly, providing well-balanced meals. She was a great wife. Since we were childhood friends, we've been together for more than 20 years now. Her father was a benefactor in my life. Hannah's father used to teach children martial arts at a local gym. I had been attending it since I was in elementary school. My own father passed away when I was in the third grade. My parents were estranged from our relatives, so it was just my mom and me after that. But my mom was often bedridden due to the shock of losing my father. I was still a child, and without any relatives to turn to, I didn't know what to do and felt completely lost. It was then that Hannah's father, a man named George, came to our rescue. George had lost his wife and was raising Hannah on his own. Perhaps it was because of that, he understood how my mother, who had just become a single parent, might be feeling. He explained this to me with a kind voice. He really helped us out by calling the insurance company, my mother's employer, and the people at the municipal office, even asking them to help with some administrative procedures. There were also times when he took me in and let me stay over at his place. Thanks to George stepping in, my mother was able to rest. She gradually recovered. It was around that time. That's when Hannah stopped being just the daughter of the instructor. Hannah and George became like family to me. When I, now an adult, went to George to tell him that I wanted to marry Hannah, he was overjoyed. Jeff, I've always considered you as a son. I'm so happy to know that you'll truly be my son now. I think I'll never forget how he told me this with a smile. I was supposed to have had a happy marriage, blessed by my benefactor, but I ended up divorcing Hannah. It was all my fault. Hannah was always concerned about my health and tried to cherish our time together. Are you all right? Shouldn't you take a break? How about we go to a spa together next time? Let's relax. I thought we were kind childhood friends when we first got married, but I somehow came to find it bothersome to have Hannah worry about me. My desire to succeed at work was so strong that I was taking her kindness for granted. Shut up. You wouldn't understand. This is a crucial time for me. Don't bother me. I kept saying such things. Hannah might have looked hurt, but I wouldn't have noticed. It had been a long time since I had actually looked at Hannah, as I was always throwing harsh words at her. Then one day, Hannah said to me, I want to spend this weekend together. It's an important day. Please come home early. I have something to talk about, about Dad. Could I tell you in detail then? Oh, got it. I'll come home early. At that moment, I simply responded, got it, without confirming what she meant by important day or asking about what happened to George. I suppose I had developed a bad habit of mindlessly responding to Hannah's words. So, as I often did, I casually replied to Hannah, and sure enough, I forgot my promise to come home early and ended up working overtime on the weekend. The only message I sent to Hannah was, working late, don't need dinner. I didn't even mention the promise because I had completely forgotten about it. Hannah usually replies right away, but not this time. But I didn't care about that either. I was solely focused on the work in front of me. When I returned home after midnight, Hannah was already gone. There was a short note and completed divorce papers left behind. The note read, I wanted more family time, but your important thing is your job. Good luck with your work. Please take care of your health. Reading it, I finally remembered the promise I made with Hannah. Glancing at the calendar, I noticed it was marked as my birthday. The important day for Hannah was neither our anniversary or Hannah's birthday. It was my birthday that Hannah considered an important day. Hannah's birthday was a month before mine. But I don't remember ever celebrating it. 
Hannah was planning to celebrate the birthday of a husband who couldn't even remember his wife's birthday. Looking around the house, Hannah's belongings were gone. I didn't think she could move everything out in a single day. Perhaps Hannah was expecting me not to keep the promise and had been gradually moving her things out. But I hadn't even noticed that Hannah's belongings were starting to disappear from the house. By the time I noticed, Hannah and her things were already gone. Hannah didn't ask for alimony. It must have been a tough marriage for her. I believe she had the right to ask for it. But Hannah didn't demand anything from me. Instead, she left the house, leaving behind a note with words of concern for me. I couldn't chase after Hannah. I filled out the divorce papers and submitted them the next day. In the end, I couldn't listen to what George wanted to say, the talk Hannah had mentioned. I told George about the divorce over the phone. I didn't have the courage to face him. I apologized for not taking care of Hannah. George didn't sound angry or sad. He simply said, I understand. The call ended there, and we haven't spoken since. Because of my selfish actions, I lost both my wife and benefactor in an instant. I was a wreck after the divorce. I had no motivation, started missing work, and eventually quit my job. I was left with nothing, as my life had been all about work. I tried getting jobs a few times, but I'd always end up missing work and wouldn't last long. Now, I'm just getting by with day labor. I've been living like this for four years. I've turned 32. Here I am now, waiting for Hannah at a coffee shop. I received a call from Hannah a few days ago. There's someone I want you to meet. I know you must be thinking, what is she? The one who gave the divorce papers, saying but. No, I'm the one to blame for the divorce. Hannah, you did nothing wrong. No, that's not true. Could you just meet once? There's someone I really want you to meet. Someone you want to meet. Someone I know. You know him, but also you don't. I didn't understand what she meant, but I decided to meet him. I've always wanted to apologize to Hannah directly. This might be my last chance. The old-fashioned door chime of the coffee shop rang. As I turned towards the entrance, there were Hannah and her father, George. When I gave a small wave as a sign, Hannah came over. The person she wanted me to meet was George. I was curious about what kind of person he would be, as she said, you know them, but also, you don't. Hannah still looked as beautiful as ever. It was a stark contrast to how worn out I'd become in the past four years. Jeff, it's been a while. You look like you've lost some weight. Is work keeping you busy? I know, I quit my old job. What? Oh, I see. Hearing that I had quit my job, Hannah kindly did not ask me for details, as if she had guessed what was going on. Miss, who is this gentleman over here? For a moment, I didn't understand who was speaking. The only person in front of me was George. But for him to refer to Hannah as Miss and me as who is this gentleman, even though we've known each other since we were kids, there's no way he would forget. He is not the kind of person who goes around deliberately saying things the wrong way. That's why I was so puzzled, staring at Hannah. Then, looking down with a sad expression, Hannah said, My dad, you see, he has dementia. Dementia. I'd heard of it, of course, but I didn't fully comprehend it until then. But I felt something was off about George. He had a constant smile on his face. He was always a cheerful person, but he used to have a dignified presence. Now, he just looks like a jolly old man, always grinning. Actually, even before the divorce, I had been noticing that he was becoming more forgetful. After the divorce, signs of dementia began to emerge gradually. Now, there are times when he can't recognize me as he used to. Hannah revealed, with a sigh. So, there were signs before the divorce too. 
I couldn't hide my shock at the change in my benefactor. Why didn't you tell me? I wanted to, but you were always so busy with work. I thought we could talk about it leisurely at a birthday celebration or something. Right, it was my fault that we didn't have time to talk. I'm sorry, you had to move out your stuff bit by bit, didn't you? Yes, I'm sorry, I couldn't fully trust you. I was moving my belongings into a storage container bit by bit. I thought I could move back home if you kept your promises, but you didn't. You never came home early, so I moved my stuff from the storage container to a studio apartment after the divorce. Perhaps Hannah would still be with me as a family if only I had kept my promises. I felt pathetic for having lost something so precious. I'm truly sorry for those times. After the divorce, I lost my motivation and quit my job. I used to think work was everything. I wasn't really paying attention to you, Hannah. It's okay now. I've also been holding back, not expressing my feelings because I was a housewife. I should have expressed my complaints and demands to you. We used to say anything to each other when we were kids. I wonder when we stopped talking to each other. Hannah's words pierced my heart. We were childhood friends who ended up marrying each other. We had a long-standing relationship. Yet, things still didn't work out. Just because we were childhood friends, just because we were married, I shouldn't have taken communication for granted. I was filled with feelings of regret and remorse. Then, a sudden interruption came. Hannah, Jeff, shall we go to the gym? I've got some candies for you too. George, who had been smiling silently, suddenly suggested. Surprised, Hannah hurriedly explained to me. Dad, you see, his memory fluctuates. He remembers and forgets. But lately, he's been remembering your name, Jeff, and our childhood stories a lot when looking at photo albums. He often gets angry and throws tantrums due to his dementia. But when he remembers you, Jeff, he's very calm. Oh, is that why you wanted me to meet him today? At my words, Hannah nodded. My father's heart is failing. He's been in and out of the hospital a lot. When a vacancy arises, he will be admitted to a hospital specializing in dementia. But then I won't be able to see him as often as I do now. So, you know, just until he goes into the hospital, why don't you talk to him with me? I want to let him enjoy his memories in a peaceful way, while he can remember. I was at a loss for words at Hannah's sudden proposal. But it's Hannah's wish, and more importantly, if it can make George my benefactor, can be immersed in his memories peacefully, I wanted to do whatever I could. So, what about you, Jeff and Hannah? Are you guys off to play outside again? You two are always full of energy. George, unable to recognize Hannah and me in front of him. But he seemed so happy talking about our childhood. Please, I think we still have time. I'm sorry for the trouble I caused you due to the divorce. I haven't been able to do anything for him. That's why I want to do what I can for my father now. What exactly should I do? Why don't we spend time together again and have tea like this sometimes? Go to the gym. Dad often says he needs to pick up Hannah and Jeff from elementary school, so he might be happy if we take him there. We weren't a good married couple, were we? But we were more like a family when we were kids. I want to recreate those times when the three of us spent time together. I think Dad will remember more if we do that. I want him to enjoy his memories. Hannah sounded very serious. I wonder if I can do it. I failed to cherish Hannah. I'm such a loser. I hope I won't ruin George's memories. That won't happen. Let's try to remember how we felt when we were kids. I'm sure we were considerate of each other. Shall we try again? At Hannah's words, my heart was set. For the next six months until a bed became available in the specialized dementia hospital, I spent as much time as I could with Hannah and George. George would suddenly get angry or zone out. But whenever we opened the photo album, or when Hannah and I visited the places from our memories, he was always calm. There were times when he seemed to recognize us, and others when he didn't. But that didn't really matter. George was able to enjoy his memories. That was enough. 
Hannah and I talked a lot more than when we were married. Now we laugh about how strange it is that we didn't talk this much when we were married. Six months after I started spending time with George and Hannah, George was admitted to a dementia specialized hospital out of state in Arizona. His heart was weak, so there were no options but the hospital outside of our state. We could visit him, but obviously not as frequently as we used to. On the day of his departure, the facility staff came to pick him up in their car. George, not fully grasping the situation, was smiling while Hannah was in tears. Dad, take care. Despite her call, George just kept smiling without saying anything. But when he got in the car and the staff rolled down the window, after looking at Hannah and me, George said, you two take good care of each other. Those were the same words he said to us when we got married. Whether he recognized us or simply remembered the wedding, we couldn't tell, but Hannah and I answered together, we will, just like we did at the wedding. We waved goodbye until the car carrying George disappeared from sight. A month has passed since George entered the hospital. His condition has been going back and forth. We are planning to visit George together next week. Since then, Hannah and I have been meeting often. We likely share the same feelings of cherishing each other. But that doesn't mean we want to remarry right away. We don't want to repeat the same mistakes. We can be together without getting married. We are searching for a way to stay together while caring for each other. Whether that's as a couple or as a married pair, we are not sure yet but Hannah seems happier now than when we were married. I want to keep this happiness going as long as possible. My name is Raymond Johnson, and I'm turning 28 this year. I work in sales at a well-recognized major corporation. I think my sales performance is pretty decent. It's a result of me pushing myself hard at work since I never really exerted myself in anything else. My mother passed away last year. My father left because of divorce when I was too young to remember him. But since my mom passed, I've been feeling unmotivated. In my job and everything else. Every day feels like I'm just going through the motions at work after breaking up with my girlfriend. In the midst of this, something happened. Aunt Raymond, the section head wants to see you in the office. The moment I returned from an outside appointment, a clerk called out to me. My section head and I have never gotten along well. Probably because my lack of motivation is a thorn in his side. It seems he doesn't like that even a clearly unmotivated me was the top contract maker last month. It's a hassle dealing with him since he picks fights over the smallest things. It's Raymond here. May I come in? I knock on the manager's office door and enter. The manager and section head look at me with stern faces. Can you explain what this is about? What the section head thrust in front of me was an annual contract with a major client I had been working on. It was a job I had just handed over to a junior after being told to do so by the team leader. In other words, a project no longer in my hands. Why would you leave this in such a half-finished state and hand it over to a junior that's irresponsible? While I was thinking about what was going on, the team section started yelling at me. He thinks that by yelling and intimidating, he can get his way. It's clear that the section head, who seems to be under this misunderstanding, wants to shift all the blame for this failure onto me. His words are nothing but criticisms of me. I think the section head probably wanted to claim this contract as his own success after it had passed from me to the junior. The evidence for this is that the junior came to me just the other day saying he felt like his job had been stolen. If successful, it would be his credit. If it failed, he could eliminate me, a thorn in his side. Pretty cunning. I held my silence as my supervisor continued to berate me. 
the manager just watched silently. In the end, he handed me my transfer notice, you're being transferred. The new assignment was a secondment to a client's factory. In other words, a demotion. I was so tired, I just took the notice without any objections. Then I checked where I was being transferred to and exclaimed, Alaska, isn't it freezing there? My comment, breaking the silence, made a vein on the manager's forehead which. Is that all you have to say? After that, the manager lectured me for an hour and a half. Man, being seconded at this time of year, what the hell did you do? The factory manager, holding the transfer notice, said this with a laugh when he came to greet me. Well, it was an obviously awkward timing for a transfer. Anyone would suspect that I messed up something. The post I was assigned to was a factory located in the suburbs of Anchorage, Alaska. I'm from LA and really hate the cold. Even though it's the south of Alaska, it's still cold for me. Even though summer was almost here, there was no sign of it at all. I look forward to working with you. I've heard that I will be in charge of general affairs. I'm from a sales background, so I'm counting on your guidance and strict instruction. As I entered the office and bowed deeply, everyone greeted me with warm applause. I remember feeling relieved and my shoulders relaxing at their response. The company housing provided for me was a room in an old apartment building. I hear there are many students and workers who are away from home living here. There was a young man living in the room next to mine. We've only exchanged greetings a few times, but he always seems to be with a different girl, so I guess he's quite a player. The apartment is on a hill, and you can see the sea in the distance. At night, the city lights are beautiful and opening a can of beer while looking at the view from the balcony after work became my blissful moment. Today, as I was walking up the hill to return to the apartment, I passed by several children carrying paper lanterns. It was that brief time between sunset and twilight. I felt as if I'd slipped into a different dimension. Spotting a large bamboo decoration in the playground of the daycare halfway up the hill, I finally realized that today is July 7th, the day of the Star Festival. I guess the children are going to a festival. Thinking that, I unlocked the door to my apartment. Loosening my tie, I headed straight to the fridge to grab a can of beer. Then I went straight out to the balcony and opened the beer. There were paper lanterns swaying here and there on the hill. I could hear the children singing something on the wind. Tassels on bamboo, it's the star fest, you know. It sounded like a children's song I've never heard before, and it had a strange feel to it. Learning little by little about the unknown aspects of this land isn't so bad. For the first time since my transfer, I thought something like that. At that moment, someone knocked at my door. I didn't know anyone well enough in this place to visit me. Thinking it must be the factory manager or the landlord, I opened the door without checking the intercom monitor. Standing in front of the door was a beauty in a robe. She was wearing a navy and white robe and holding a paper lantern. She sang the song the children had been singing earlier in a shy, quiet voice while looking down bashfully. Bamboo for the Star Festival, let's celebrate. I need a candle, please. The next moment, she wraps her arms around my neck and buries her face in my chest. I hope she'll forgive me for instinctively wrapping my arms around her waist when embraced by a beauty in a robe whom I've just met. I want more than just a candle, I want your best, she whispers in a slightly husky voice, and I'm taken aback. But she's definitely not someone I know. For her honor, I had to say something, and I called out, I think you've got the wrong guy. My voice ended up being louder than I intended, but I was nervous too, so I hope she'll forgive me. Hey, aren't you, Jack? Startled by my voice, she lifted her head and for the first time, really looked at my face. Uh, no, I'm Raymond. 
I responded with a wry smile. Apparently, she mistook me for her boyfriend. Her face turned beach red in an instant. From this close, I could see the long eyelashes outlining her wide open eyes tremble. I, I'm so sorry. It seems like I've made a mistake. She quickly detached herself from me. Just at that moment, the door to the adjacent room opened and a cheerful couple, and wind at the waist, emerged. The young woman called the man Jack. At that point, I understood the situation. The beauty in a robe froze at the sight of the two of us. As the man began to turn his face towards us, she slipped into my apartment's entrance to escape his gaze. Pushed by her momentum, I fell back into my own front door. What a twist of fate. I found myself toppled over, trapped under a beauty at the front door. In this state, I silently waited as the sounds of footsteps from the adjacent room faded away. Eventually, the sound of an elevator door opening followed by the pitter-patter of children's feet overpowered the previous pair's footsteps. Gently pushing off her soft body, I asked, Are you okay? The beauty in a robe, her face a daze, pulled away from me and sat on the spot. Her side profile was somewhat sad, but beautiful. I'm sorry. I not only made a mistake but also caused this inconvenience. I was really trying to surprise him. She tightly gripped her robe and lowered her head, repeatedly apologizing to me. A single tear dropped onto the back of her clenched hand. Wanting to comfort her, I reached out to touch her shoulder, but just then, the half open front door swung fully open. Star wishes on bamboo during the festival of star. Let's celebrate. Give me a candle, eh? There stood children in robes, each carrying a lantern. Singing a festive song, they reached out their hands. The beauty in a robe said, all right, all right, pulling out candies from a plastic bag she held and handing them to the kids. With candies in hand, the children joyfully ran off towards the next house. It felt strangely like Halloween, and I just blankly watched the scene unfold. Is this something like trick or treat? I asked the beauty in a robe who had been seeing off the children. The beauty in a robe looked at me in surprise. Then, as if understanding, she muttered softly, you're not from around here. This is a candle collection event. On the day of the Star Festival, kids go around houses like this to get candies. It seems they used to really get candles back in the day, but now the kids are more interested in candies. As she said this, she extended her hand towards me. With her help, I finally managed to get up. I'm embarrassed. I try my best, but it didn't work out. She said this with a slightly relieved expression on her face. I've been told that I'm not cute since my high school days, so I tried a little. Pretty dumb, right? The beauty in a robe seemed to be one of the neighbors. I kind of knew there were other women but I thought maybe he might choose me. I felt a pang of sadness and wanted to comfort her, but I couldn't find the right words. In response to my silence, she gave a faint smile. Afterward, she apologized to me numerous times and left a plethora of candies in my hands as a gift. Uh, I should have asked her name. As the elevator doors closed with a soft chime, I felt a tinge of regret. I saw the beauty in a row begin a week later. When she appeared at the factory office, she looked so different from before that at first, I didn't realize it was the same person. I'm Alice Mitchell, the consulting attorney, dressed in a black suit with high heels. The understated yet weld and makeup suits her perfectly. When she wore a robe, her lips were a cute pink, but now they're painted a calm beige. Thank you for the other day. I had to do a double take when she whispered in a voice only I could hear. It seems that she is the legal advisor for this factory. She's a female lawyer who owns a law office near the company houses, and according to the factory manager, she's very competent. Surprised by the unexpected reunion, Alice said to me, 
I wanted to apologize for the other day. Uh, you already know our friend Alice. Please listen. Alice has always had bad luck with men. Recently, she's been smitten with a young man. The factory manager, who has known Alice since she was a child, started to gossip about her personal life. Panicked, Alice silenced the manager by covering his mouth with her hand. You don't have to talk about that. Pouting at the factory manager, Alice looked a bit like a young girl. I decided to take her upon her offer of an apology. We agreed to have dinner and exchanged contact information. I realized this was the first time I had exchanged personal contact information since arriving here. Thinking about our first meeting makes me want to laugh. She probably saw that on my face. Alice, who was discussing work, warned me with a glance, saying don't. I gave her a got it look in response. It felt like we were having a secret conversation and my heart was pounding unusually hard. Later, my dinner with Alice ended in an argument. At first, the atmosphere was good. We were at a nice western restaurant near the harbor and everything was going smoothly until we had a little wine. As the meal was nearing its end, I think we were both getting drunk. I'm not good at alcohol. I don't think I have a bad temperament when I'm drunk, but I do tend to let my true feelings show a bit. Do you like younger men? When Alice told me she had broken up with that boyfriend, I impulsively asked her that. For a moment, it felt like the temperature of the atmosphere surrounding our table dropped by about two degrees. Despite my tactless question, Alice smiled with adult composure. What a rude man to ask something like that. She placed her wine glass on the table. Does age matter in love? But the guy next door, he's a college student, isn't he? You're around 35, right, Alice? Isn't that a bit risky? The day after the commotion, I ran into the neighbor in the elevator and had a brief chat. I was surprised when I heard that he was still a college student. I, I'm only 32. Alice's voice quivered as she corrected me about her age. Really? Well, there's not much difference between 35 and 32. For a college student, both ages might seem like old hags. Uh, alcohol can indeed be scary. At that time, I think I was just trying to grab her attention. I continued to provoke her with my words. Regretting it when you're sober doesn't do any good. Right, I'm an old hag, but there's a big difference between 32 and 35. What, in what way? At that point, Alice's patience snapped. She stood up from her chair, glaring at me. If you round up, there's a big difference between 30 and 40, you idiot. That's where my memory cuts off. Apparently, I was hit on the head with a baguette. That night, I learned the hard way that even hard bread can be a deadly weapon. Since that night, Alice has been giving me the cold shoulder. She has a law office near my housing complex, and every time she sees me on her way back, she pointedly looks away. I want to make amends, but I can't seem to find the right opportunity. Half a year after I was transferred to the factory, I heard that my former colleagues from the main office were planning a trip to Anchorage. A former colleague contacted me and suggested meeting up. They apparently planned to visit this factory. Although I look forward to seeing my old colleagues, hearing that the former manager will also be coming half ruins the excitement. A few days later, the group from the main office arrived in Anchorage for their trip. They also came for a tour of our factory, which is one of their suppliers. It was nice to see my old colleagues again, unchanged, and even being asked for work advice. Everyone at the office was amazed to see me, who usually only handles attendance at the factory, giving advice to the elite from the main office. Hey, you're surprisingly reliable, Raymond. Why were you transferred here? The factory manager kindly brought me some iced tea when things finally calmed down. There were various reasons, I replied vaguely. 
Alice was also at the office that day, and I could feel her curious gaze. Hey, Raymond, come here. The one calling me over so arrogantly was my former manager. He was gesturing for me at the office entrance. With a heavy sigh, I got up and responded to his beckoning. It's been a while, thanks for the other day. A greeting laced with a hint of sarcasm, the former section head made a face of displeasure. He seemed to be aware of what he did. You haven't told anyone, right? I nodded in response to the manager's words. When I was transferred here and left the main office, the section head called me in and said the same thing. I was fed up with him going on and on about how it might have been his mistake, but at the end of the day, it was my fault for handing over the client to my junior. You may have forgotten, but you were the one who ordered me to hand over the client to my junior, right? And I heard you were the one who mentored the junior. The manager, not expecting a comeback from me, looked surprised. He hurriedly said, you're talking too loud. So you do realize it'd be a problem if someone overheard. The section head looked ridiculous as he panicked and I couldn't help but feel amused. I don't need a boss who sets up his own subordinates and then gloats about it. Anyway, that contract mess was your fault. It's got nothing to do with me, you understand, right? As my co-workers, who finished the tour, began to gather near the office, the section head wrapped up the conversation unilaterally. I let out a big sigh as I watched him rejoin the main company's circle. Seems like I still have some lingering feelings for the headquarters. Reconnecting with old colleagues and being stimulated probably contributed to that. There was a part of me that felt sad about not being able to return to that circle. I didn't mean to listen, but Alice stood behind me and seemed to have been there for a while. She seemed to have overheard my conversation with the section head. Still, she said, mistakes should be corrected. It's all in the past. I've come to terms with it. I didn't want to deal with this issue again, so I made a non-committal reply. Alice looked at me with a troubled expression. After studying my face for a moment, she let out a small sigh. Do you realize what kind of face you're making? It's like you're unbearably sad. Why don't you be honest? I don't want to see that face of yours, Raymond. I hurriedly touched my face as Alice pointed it out. I felt embarrassed to have been seen in that state. Pretending to have given up while still having regrets is the most uncool thing. I, I'm really uncool, pretending not to have any lingering feelings. As I covered my trembling mouth with my hand, I admitted my true feelings to Alice. I felt like I couldn't lie to her. It's not uncool. It's not shameful not to give up on what you want. Let's reclaim your place. I'll help you. Alice said those encouraging words while looking straight into my eyes. Thank you. As I bowed my head, she replied, leave it to me, with a smile. Then began a series of hectic days. With the cooperation of my old colleagues, I collected evidence of the manager's wrongdoing. It turned out that not just me, but other colleagues had also been blamed for his mistakes or had their achievements stolen. The accusations kept piling up. We sought out every illegal aspect. Thanks to Alice's efforts, the documentation for accusing the manager was prepared quickly. You're surprisingly popular despite being the kind of person who'd say such terrible things to me. Looking at the petition for my return to the headquarters collected by my former colleagues, Alice murmured in surprise. It seemed that she had not forgiven me for what happened that night. I'm really sorry about that time. I was nervous and drank too much. That night, I got too drunk because I was nervous about being alone with Alice. She laughed nervous about being with an old woman like me. Rise seemed to see right through me. Taking a deep breath, I turned to face Alice. That day, I really wanted to make a move on you, but I just couldn't say it. At my words, Alice gave a satisfied smile. 
Then she cut the conversation short with, We'll continue this later. It seemed my confession had fallen on deaf ears. Then, the accusation at the head office was successful. As soon as I contacted Alice, she kept repeating I'm glad with obvious joy. Now I can return to the head office, that's good news, isn't it? I could hear a hint of sadness in Alice's voice coming from my phone. With that, I made up my mind. I decided to jump on the last flight to Anchorage. I couldn't wait to see Alice's face again. I took a taxi from the airport and rushed to Alice's law firm. It was already late, but there were still lights on in the office. I'm back. When I opened the door to Alice's law firm, she was working overtime by herself. Oh, you're back already. Congratulations on your return to head office. When are you going back? Alice put down the documents she was looking at and started spinning her pen with her slim fingers. Her eyes were slightly red. Do you plan to hire a secretary here? I think I could do the job quite well. Alice was surprised and dropped her pen on the floor. What, why? What about the head office? I decided to be honest with myself. I reported to her that I declined the offer to return to the head office and also submitted my resignation. I just want to be with you, Alice. Forever. Is that bad? There's. There's no reason that would be bad. Her response was faint. For the first time in my life, I realized the importance of being true to myself, and I think she taught me that. Struggling to achieve the future you desire is nothing to be ashamed of. Oh, but I can't hire you here. Send your resume to the factory manager. I didn't miss her ears turning red as she suddenly switched to a business-like tone. My future is forever with her. The future I desire is one where she's always by my side. And I'm willing to make any effort to achieve it. My name is Theodore Johnson. I'm more of an impatient person, and I like to eat my food quickly, and I like burgers and sandwiches which I can just stuff in. Especially, I've always been a fan of BLT sandwich. That day happened to be a day off for the surgical clinic I run. I'd spent the late morning at my favorite spot, a diner near the station known for its chicken dishes, having a drink and getting into a good mood. For a finishing touch, I had a chicken and egg sandwich that served as both my breakfast and lunch. My clinic is located in a regional city with a population of just under 100,000. Near the station, there is a decent amount of commercial facilities. In the middle of the shopping street extending from the station, there's the diner and a few doors down, my clinic. If you go through the shopping street, residential areas flank both sides and straight ahead leads to a low-lying mountain dotted with farms. My family home is also located on that mountain and used to produce specialty summer oranges. My parents are both gone. They passed away in their late 80s, so they must have had a fulfilled life. Now that I'm approaching 60, I live alone in the house my parents left behind. I was once married. However, we parted ways after seven years of marriage. It was a common issue of personality clashes. Ever since, I thought living alone and doing as I like suited me better than married life. Anyway, that day, shortly after I started up the mountain slope where my house was located, feeling good after having had a few drinks and a full belly, I heard a young woman scream, eek. Looking up the slope, I saw summer oranges rolling down. I picked up one with my left hand, stopped the next one with my right foot, and another with my left foot. The fourth one rolled between my legs. For the fifth one, I reflexively tossed the grilled chicken I had brought back for my evening drink and caught it with my right hand. I went up the slope, holding those oranges to where the young woman was. Upon reaching, she turned out to be a girl in her early 20s with short hair and an innocent look on her face. Ouch, I think I might have sprained my ankle. 
She was wearing sporty white leggings and was sitting down, rubbing her ankle. Here, let me see. I handed her the oranges I was holding and placed my hand on her ankle. Ouch, there, she exclaimed. It was a mild sprain for sure. Still, I couldn't just leave her there. So, I gave her a shoulder to lean on and walked her down the slope and took her to my clinic. I put a patch on her, tightly wrapped her ankle in a bandage, and gave her some first aid. Come back tomorrow, I'll examine you properly then. It was my day off, and I had a few drinks in me. I'm sure it wasn't anything serious, but I told the girl to come back tomorrow. It's all my mom's fault. When you're talking to others, call her mother, not my mom, Ock. Yes, sir. She stuck out her tongue cheekily after she replied. That day, she'd been sent by her mom to the unmanned fruit stand at the top of the hill to buy some summer oranges. As she was coming down the hill with the oranges in a paper bag she brought, the handle of the bag suddenly broke and the oranges rolled out. It's my mom, I mean. My mom keeps reusing department store bags because she wants to be eco-friendly. The handle must have been about to break off. Her mom must have been quite frugal. I almost dropped my smartphone too. Were you walking while messing with your smartphone? Yeah. I scolded her, telling her that was far worse. Staring down at a smartphone for long periods can strain your neck and lead to stiff shoulders and headaches. That's a condition called text neck. It's dangerous, so stop using your smartphone while walking. As I told her, she gave me another drawn out yes sir in reply. Her house seemed to be just ahead in the residential area, within walking distance from my clinic, but I felt sorry for her having to walk on that foot. I suggested her to take a taxi. You should get there within base fare. Do you have money for that? I'm fine, I have it. Nodding, I gave her a crutch. As I walked her to the clinic entrance, she kept turning back to smile brightly at me. As I was about to go back inside, I noticed the part-time job notice I taped to the entrance door was starting to peel off. It's been up for over a month now. As I fixed the notice, I wondered if I should use online job postings. Just as I was thinking about this, I found she left behind her oranges. I'll give them to her tomorrow. Then the next day. What's this? A gift. I have a policy of not accepting such things from patients. A woman who came with the girl from yesterday handed me a department store paper bag. She had the same face as the girl from yesterday. I thought they might be sisters. Even so, you were so kind to help my daughter yesterday when she was in trouble. It was her mother. She bowed her head and handed the paper back to me again. I caught a glimpse of what was inside. A bottle of imported whiskey. Pretty pricey stuff. That's when the girl interrupted. Doctor, please, take this. The girl pleaded, clasping her hands in front of her face as if in prayer. I thought, this is going just as planned. Then, clearing my throat, I feigned annoyance as I accepted the paper bag containing a bottle of whiskey. Whiskey, it's been a while. One more thing to look forward to tonight. The mother, even as I was about to start examining the girl, remained rooted to the spot. I told her to wait in the waiting room. This isn't kindergarten, you don't need to babysit. Yes, you're right, I am in the way, aren't I? Her acknowledgement that she was in the way gave me pause, but I handed her the forgotten summer orange and she took it to the waiting room. The x-rays confirmed that there was nothing wrong with the girl's leg. It would surely be fully healed in two or three days. Within 10 minutes of the treatment ending, the mother and daughter returned. Doctor, we wanted to talk to you about the part-time job notice you posted out front. The mother, her demeanor now entirely different, spoke briskly, her eyes shining as she looked at me. Would you be able to do it? As I spoke, 
I couldn't help staring at the mother's face, still convinced they must be sisters. No, my daughter, would she be suitable for the job? Her, this one here, beside her mother, the girl stuck out her tongue and gave a little bow. Listen, if that's the case, you should speak for yourself. You're not a child anymore. I scolded the girl, warning the mother not to spoil her too much. That said, I didn't need a part-time worker. It's reception work, but it's not that difficult once you get used to it. So, I decided to hire the girl. The girl, whom I'll call Emma, began her part-time receptionist job three times a week once her foot healed. She was usually quite dependent on her mother when they were together, but when alone, she showed a responsible side and quickly learned the job. Moreover, her vibrant and cheerful smile was well received by both the staff and the patients. However, this also brought some trouble for me. Doctor, doctor, let's walk together there. Emma would always wait for my work to finish, and as soon as I left the clinic, she would dart over, crossed her arm with mine. And then, resting her head on my shoulder, she would start skipping along. That's enough, stop that. Why, you're too young to be so familiar with men. Doctor, you're just being shy. I was at a loss. I had taken in quite a naughty girl. A month or so had passed since Emma started her part-time job at my place, when one day, my daughter, she's always grateful for your help. Emma's mother, Mary, visited the clinic with a smile as radiant as Emma's. Then, she offered a box of sweets, saying, this is for all of you. I thanked her and accepted it. Then, she handed me a paper bag from a department store, saying, and this is for you, doctor. Mary looked down shyly. Somehow, her behavior made my heart skip a beat. This is not a gift from a patient, so it should be okay, right? Um, oh, well, thank you. When I looked into the bag, there was a bottle of high-end whiskey. Doctor, you do like your drink, don't you? I'm not averse to it. But the last time I brought you one, you looked somewhat grim, yet the corners of your lips were raised. You looked quite pleased. Mary stuck out her tongue playfully. Even her gesture resembled her daughter, Emma. On my next day off, I had a drink at my usual diner, and for my final meal, I ordered favorite grilled chicken. Oh, wait a second. I hastily withdrew my order. I'm not in the mood for a chicken today. I told the owner of the diner so. Um, how about fried rice? No. No, no, that's not it either. I've decided on risotto. On my way home. As I began to climb up the hill, a summer orange came rolling down from above. I picked it up and looked up the hill. Emma was there, smiling mischievously. Emma waved her hand and started running down the hill towards me. Don't fall, be careful. When she got to where I was, she stopped placed her hands on her knees, and caught her breath. There was a faint sweet scent coming from her. Doctor, have you been drinking? I nodded. What did you eat? Well, some side dishes, and, for the last dish, risotto. Emmy asked what I would do for dinner. I told her I hadn't decided yet. In that case, come over to my place, let's eat together. Without waiting for my response, Emma took out her phone and called her mother, Mary. It's settled, doctor. My mom also wants to treat you to dinner. Call her mother, not my mom. There was still some time left until dinner. I decided to part ways with Emma and headed home. We agreed to meet in front of the clinic at 5 p.m. When I arrived at the clinic at 5, Emma was already there, passing the time on her smartphone waiting for me. You should limit your time on that smartphone. Emma shrugged and stuck her tongue out at me cheekily. As we began walking towards her house, she, as usual, looped her arm through mine. 
I had given up on any futile resistance. Is your father around? She replied plainly that she doesn't have father. My mom, she's a single mother, so my father was never in the picture. I regretted asking, sensing I might have asked something I shouldn't have. My mother works the cash register at a large supermarket across the train station. Emma continued, chest swelling with pride. She boasted about how her mother, Mary, was faster and more accurate at the register than any other employee. Not only that, she treated every product with the utmost care. There was no doubt that for Emma, Mary was a mother to be proud of. The place where Emma and Mary lived was an old two-bedroom apartment that had seen many years pass by. I hope it's okay to drop by so suddenly tonight, I began. Oh no, it's our pleasure. After all, it was Emma who insisted on bringing you over, wasn't it? As Mary and I exchanged greetings at the entrance, Emma pushed me from behind into the house. On the modest-sized dining table, there was an array of dishes that Mary had apparently prepared for dinner. Beef and potato stew, cob salad, rib steak, and grilled salmon. The food was simple, but it had that classic, comforting taste of home. As Emma guided me to my seat at the table, Mary brought out a can of beer from the refrigerator. Oh dear, it's still lukewarm, isn't it? Emma jumped in. That's what I told you to pick some up from the convenience store on the way here. But buying it from the supermarket where I work is cheaper since I get a staff discount. Soon enough, a playful argument broke out between mother and daughter. For some reason, I ended up playing the mediator. All right, all right, let's settle down. Whether it's cold or lukewarm, beer is still beer. It's perfectly fine. And so, Emma and Mary and I shared a meal around the dining table. I don't think we've ever had dinner with a man at home like this, have we? Emma mused. But dear, we've had dinner with Tom before, remember? Mary reminded her. That was when we were kids. He was just a boy, not a man. She then turned to me and explained that Tom was just an old childhood friend from kindergarten. Excuse me. I need to use the restroom. Emma, you don't need to announce that. Mary reprimanded her hastily and then turned to me, bowed her head. Emma stuck her tongue out at me before scampering off to the restroom. Mary took a sip of her beer, which she claimed she rarely drank, her cheeks turning a shade of pink. You know, the day you helped Emma, she twisted her ankle and you scolded her. She told me all about it. I, I'm sorry about that. No, it's okay. She seemed quite happy about it. Happy about being scolded by me. Yes. Mary spoke to me. She's been raising her daughter, Emma, as a single mother, working hard to prevent anyone from blaming her lack of a father. She said Emma turned out to be such a good, obedient girl. But still, just being a mother, I feel like I can't scold her properly. At that moment, Emma returned from the bathroom. Emma, with a carefree air, hugged me from behind. Hey, did you wash your hands properly at half past ten in the evening? I left, seen off by Mary and Emma. As I was climbing up the hill towards my house, I started to think. Usually, on my days off, I only thought about going to bed early to prepare for the next day. But that night, the one I spent with Mary and Emma, it felt like a waste to just go to bed. Maybe I should take a walk around before heading home. So, I changed direction and strolled around the night streets, gazing at the blue moon. And I thought. I had once failed at marriage and thought I'd stay single for life. That was me. The next day. On my way home from work, I went to the supermarket where Mary works, which is located on the other side of the station. I found Mary working briskly and got drawn to her checkout line. Just as Emma bragged, Mary was a fast worker. Her energetic smile never faded, yet her eyes were serious. I felt like I could watch her forever. 
That's how I felt. Oh, doctor, I rarely come to this supermarket. Once Mary made sure there were no customers behind me, she placed a please use the next register sign on her counter. From then on, on the days when Emma had a day off from her part-time job, I would stop by Mary's supermarket after work. Mary adjusted her shift to match the time I showed up and came to meet me at the coffee shop next to the supermarket. Half a year later, You two seem a bit tense, don't you? Emma said to me and Mary, who were posing in front of the camera. It was at a photo studio in town. We didn't have a wedding ceremony. Instead, we decided to take a commemorative photo. Our wedding photo. With the cameraman's cue, the flash went off. The photographer suggested another shot. Hey, Emma, you should join us. Let's take a picture with the three of us. Emma nodded energetically with a smile and stepped between me and Mary. We all looked at each other. Our smiles naturally broke out. All right, here goes. Upon the photographer's cue, we all turned our faces towards the camera at once. Our first family photo. It must have turned out beautifully. How did you like it? Your subscription to the channel encourages us to keep producing. See you in the next video.